الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي I welcome all the viewers of the social media platforms that is Facebook as well as YouTube and also the people watching us on the Peace TV network that is the Peace TV English, Urdu, Bangla and Chinese. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be upon all of you. Inshallah, we'll be starting the session. Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. Season 2, Session 2. So the questions that, that you have asked on the social media platforms, I will try to answer the questions. I will try to answer as many as possible in the time that we have. So let's take the first question. Tayyab Ali from Bihar, India, but is living in Kyrgyzstan. He asks, is there any use of the knowledge that we acquire in this world in the Akhirah? The knowledge can broadly be classified into two categories. The first is the spiritual knowledge, the knowledge of the Deen. In this, there is some part of it that is compulsory for you to gain. For example, how to offer Salah, regarding fasting, regarding giving Zakah. So you need to know this knowledge regarding the Ibadat regarding worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second category is the worldly knowledge. The worldly knowledge can broadly be classified into three more categories. The first is the knowledge that will take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, learning music. This knowledge, it is prohibited for you to learn because it will take you away from the deen. It will take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second category in the worldly knowledge, it is the knowledge that neither takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nor gets you close, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, it is mubah. It is optional. If you gain it, you will not get reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you leave it, you will not be sinful. And the third category in the worldly knowledge, it is the knowledge that gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, you learn science. In order to do dawah to the non-Muslims and to prove to them, use mentioning the scientific points that are mentioned in the glorious Quran. So if you learn science with this intention, inshallah you will be rewarded. So the spiritual knowledge, it will help you in the Akhirah the worldly knowledge. If it takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will not help you in the Akhirah. If it gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah, this worldly knowledge, it will help you in the Akhirah and you will be rewarded for it. If the worldly knowledge, if it does not take you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor it takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is mubah, this is optional. The next question, Ibrahim Abdullah from Sierra Leone, West Africa, he asks, why Allah uses we for himself in the Quran? Most of the languages, there are two kinds of plural. One is the plural of number and the second is royal plural or plural of respect. 
and the plural of number is the one that is more commonly used. For example, in the English language, when the Queen of England says we visit, we plan to visit America or we wish or we wish to visit so and so country. So here the Queen of England is using the word we. But here it is not the plural of number, but it is royal plural or the plural of respect. Similarly, in the Hindi language, when the Prime Minister of India or when the President of India says Ham Karna Chate Hai, Ham, which means we. Now, when the Prime Minister of India is saying Ham Karna Chate Hai, it is not the plural of number, but it is royal plural and the plural of respect. And any person who's well versed with the English language, he will know based on the context that the word used by the Queen of England, we, it is the plural of respect. Similarly, in the Arabic language, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word Nahnu for himself, referring to himself in the glorious Quran, it is not the plural of number, but it is a royal plural or plural of respect. It is singular. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say he is Allah one and only. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word we, that is Nahnu, referring to himself in the glorious Quran, it is the plural of respect or royal plural and it is not the plural of number but it is singular. The next question, Ramin from Azerbaijan, he asks, if Allah knows someone will go to hell, then why did he create that person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Hazab, chapter number 33, verse number 72. Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal-ardi wal-jibal fa'abayna an yahmilnaha wa ashfaqna minha wa hamalaha al-insan. That when we wanted to entrust or give the covenant to the mountains, to the, to, the, to the heavens, to the earth and to the mountains, but they did not take up this trust or covenant because they were afraid of it. But man took it. We human beings, we took this trust, we took this covenant, we decided to take this test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has given us human beings a free will. And the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating us human beings, it is for ibadah. It is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Dhariya, chapter number 51, verse number 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have not created the jinn and mankind except to worship me. We have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we worship Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you are good deeds. This life is a test for the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created the angels. They do not have a free will. But we human beings, we are a unique creation. We have a free will. And I would like to give you a simple example. For example, there is a person who has done bachelors in English. Now this person, he appears for an examination. And if in the examination he is asked A, B, C, D or simple things in English, so there is no point in the test, there is no point in the examination. He has done bachelors in English, he needs to be asked something of his level. Similarly, when a college when a university plans to conduct an examination of MBBS for example so this examination it is difficult the university the college knows that certain students will fail but yet the college conducts the examination to test the students to know which students have worked hard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has created us human beings he has given us a free will and all those people who do good they will be rewarded they will enter paradise and if someone does wrong he will be punished for those for those wrong acts we human beings we have a free will 
if we do good, we will be better than the angels. Because after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a free will, we have the option of either doing right or doing wrong. We choose to do the right things. So we will be rewarded from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next question, a Hindu river, he asks, if non-Muslims accept Islam, then who will give them complete knowledge about Islam? I am 20 years of age. Is it possible for me to learn how to read the Quran while working and at the same time learn Islam? Please answer me. I was a Hindu a few years back. Any person, if he wants to have the correct understanding of the deen, of the religion of Islam, he should be connected to the glorious Quran. He should read the glorious Quran with understanding. If you do not know Arabic as a language, you should read the translation of the glorious Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ra'ad, chapter number 13, verse number 28, Allah bi tatma'innul qulub. Verily in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find satisfaction. The more we are connected to the glorious Quran, the more we will find peace and tranquility in our hearts. We will find peace and tranquility in our lives. We should be connected to the glorious Quran. And as for the non-Muslims who have just accepted Islam, who have reverted, they should join an Islamic organization, an organization that specializes and focuses on rewards. And these organizations, they are available in most parts of the world. They focus on the basic tenets of Islam. For example, how to offer Salah, regarding Zakah, regarding fasting, the basic tenets of Islam, the pillars of Islam, the pillars of Iman, teaching the new Muslims the rewards regarding the basic tenets of Islam. Besides that, you can also join the IOU, that is the Islamic Online University that is run by Dr. Bilal Phillips. And it has a diploma degree and a bachelor's degree. Inshallah, if you join this university, it will, it will enhance your knowledge of Islam and will give you better understanding of the glorious Quran. We also have the KIU.org, Knowledge Islamic University, that is run by Sheikh Saada Shetri. You can join this university also. It will enhance your knowledge of Islam. Besides that, you can also vis visit IslamQA.info. This is an amazing website if you have any questions regarding islam you can ask on this website and they will respond to your queries many of the questions are already answered and they have a huge database so most of your questions will already be available on their website if it is not you can very well ask them and this website is available in several languages of the world so you can benefit through this also Besides that, you can also watch Peace TV in the four different languages. You can also download the application, the Peace TV application that is available on the App Store and that is available on Android. You can also visit zakirnight.com and inshallah it will give you more information about Islam. So these few things will inshallah help you and will give you more information and more knowledge about Islam. The next question, Assalamu alaikum sir, my name is Tanvir from Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, India. My question is, what is the best way to understand the Quran when one does not know Arabic as a language? Are there some books required to relate or to understand the Quran along with it? Firstly, I would like to say that the best way to understand the glorious Quran is to learn Arabic as a language. If you know Arabic as a language, it will give you in-depth understanding of the glorious Quran. It will give you tadabbur -e quran You will have tadabbur -e quran that is in-depth understanding of the meaning of the glorious Quran. So first thing I would request anyone who wants to, who wants to understand the glorious Quran better you should learn Arabic as a language. If this is not possible, then you can read the translation of the glorious Quran. 
as I mentioned earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Raad, chapter number 13, verse number 28, Allah bi dhikri Allahi tatma'inu al-qulub, well in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find satisfaction. You need to be connected to the glorious Quran and you will find peace and tranquility in your life. You will find satisfaction in your life. You should read the translation of the glorious Quran. Along with this, you can also read the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There is one of the best books on the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that is called as Rahik al Makhtoub, that is the sealed nectar. And it talks about our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You need to look at the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You need to study the seerah of the best human being that ever walked on the face of the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Qalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ For verily you are in the highest standard of character. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he had the best character. He was the best human being who ever walked on the face of the earth. So you need to learn the seerah of the best human being. Many people, they look up to role models. They look up to film stars as their role models. They look up to celebrities, but the person who should be our role model is none other than our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was the best human being that ever walked on the face of the earth. He was known as a walking Quran. So if you are connected to the glorious Quran, you read the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, inshallah it will help you. Besides that, you can also read Bulugh and Maram which is a very good compilation of a hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Besides that, you can also watch Peace TV, as I mentioned earlier. You can download the application. You can also listen to certain da'is, prominent da'is like Sheikh Asim al-Hakim, Sheikh Salim al-Amri, they, they come on Peace TV. They are even available on YouTube. And inshallah, if you do these few things, inshallah, it will give you better understanding of the religion of Islam and better understanding of the deen. The next question, Lamin Jame from Gambia, but living in Italy, he says, my question is, is it allowed to give charity to non-Muslims? I am in Europe and I see a non-Muslim family struggling to make both ends meet. Will I be rewarded if I help them? So the brother's basic question is that is it permitted to give charity to non-Muslims? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 8, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not prohibit you from dealing with kindness and justice with those people who have not fought you nor have driven you out of your lands. Now the Mufassirin, the commentators, they say that one type of dealing with kindness and justice with the non-Muslims is by giving them charity. It is permissible for you to give charity to the non-Muslims if you see a family struggling to be to meet is struggling. So then you can give these non-Muslims or this family charity that is sadaqah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said that he is not a Muslim who sleeps with his full stomach while his neighbor is hungry. And the neighbor includes the Muslims as well as non-Muslims. So you can very well give them sadaqah, that is charity. In fact, one category of zakah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the categories of zakah in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, one category is mu'allaf tiqulubuhum, those whose hearts are inclined towards Islam. So if you see a non-Muslim, he is... His heart is inclined towards Islam. He wants to accept Islam. Even he can be given zakah. Normally zakah cannot be given to non-Muslims. But one category of zakah can be given to those people, those non-Muslims whose hearts are inclined towards Islam. So sadaqah, charity, normal charity can be given to any non-Muslim. Whereas zakah can only be given to Muslims. One category of zakah can be given to those people whose hearts are inclined towards Islam. The next question, Pihu from Uttar Pradesh, India, he asks, I want to accept Islam, but I wouldn't be able to pray and fast because of family obligations. 
So what can I do in this situation? The brother, he has asked that he wants to accept Islam, but due to family obligations, he will not be able to pray or to fast. So what can he do? I would request the brother that first thing he should do is to accept Islam. We do not know when we will die. We do not know how long we live. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense will be in the hereafter. So we do not know when we will die. You, once you have, once you know that Islam is the true religion, once you are convinced, you should accept Islam and you should not delay. Practice will come slowly and gradually. Now since you have mentioned family obligations, you haven't specified what do you mean by family obligations. Perhaps you are referring to, maybe you are shy to pray in front of your parents. Maybe you are afraid what will your parents say when they see you praying. You need to convince your parents regarding Islam. Alhamdulillah, you are convinced regarding Islam. If you are convinced regarding Islam, you should accept Islam. And after that, you should convince your parents. Tell them, teach them regarding the beauty of Islam. And you should explain it to them regarding Salah. It is very important for a Muslim to pray. It is compulsory for a Muslim to pray. So you should explain to them regarding the benefits of Salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 45, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَانِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Verily, Salah prevents from shameful and immodest deeds. So you should tell them regarding the benefits of Salah. There are various benefits of Salah. We have the spiritual benefits, we have the medical benefits. And besides that, when it comes to fasting, you should also tell them regarding the benefits of fasting, the spiritual benefits, the medical benefits, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 183, Ya amanu, kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed to those before you so that you may attain self-restraint. And fasting has got various benefits and you can refer to the lecture, to the series of my father, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir, wherein the various spiritual benefits, the various medical benefits regarding fasting are mentioned in detail. So you should try to convince your parents and you should try to convince them that these are the benefits and you need to offer salah, you need to fast. The first thing that you should try to do is convince your parents so that you can practice Islam openly. But if you are afraid that you cannot tell your parents, then it is not a requirement for you to proclaim your religion, that you have accepted Islam. The next question by Abdul Razak from Ghana, but residing in Ecuador. There aren't many Muslims in Ecuador here and most of the cities have no Muslims at all. The animals here are killed in non-Islamic ways. As a Muslim, am I permitted to eat the meat depending on my current situation? A similar question from Imran Ashraf living in pa pa who's a Pakistani living in the Philippines. He says, in Philippines where I stay, it is difficult to slaughter an animal and eat it. Moreover, what is available in the market does not have a halal stamp. What should I do in such a scenario? What should I do in such a scenario? We need to know that the meat that we eat, it should be slaughtered in the Zabiha method. The Zabiha method, it is the method of slaughtering wherein we cut the throat, the windpipe and the blood vessels of the animal without damaging the spinal cord. Because if we cut the spinal cord, there can be a cardiac arrest, which will result in stagnation of the blood. And as science tells us that blood is a good medium of bacteria, germ and toxin. So, when we slaughter, slaughter in the Islamic method, all these, dise these diseases, they are eliminated. And the Zabiha method, the slaughtering should be done with a sharp object on, or knife. 
and it should be done swiftly. The meat that is slaughtered in the Islamic method using the Zabiha method, the meat remains flesh, fresh for a longer time. And the nerve, the nerve that is reaching to the brain, this nerve, it is disconnected when we slaughter through the Zabiha method, thus causing the animal no pain. The animal kicks and rithers, not due to pain, but due to the flow of the blood out of the body. So coming back to the question, that if Zabiha meat is not available, so what should you do? You should try to find for Zabiha meat and you should ask the chef or the person in the restaurant, if you are having food in a restaurant, that is the meat slaughtered in an Islamic way. If it is not, then you should avoid this meat. And you should, you have various other options. For example, you can get the chicken at home, you can slaughter the chicken at home, you can also eat fish, you can eat vegetables, etc. But if the meat is not halal, then you should avoid such meat. We will take the last question from Muhammad Munirul Alam Joy from Bangladesh. He says, can you explain the hadith regarding 73 sects in the Muslim Ummah out of which only one sect will go to Jannah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 159. Those people who have divided the religion and have made it into sect, O oh Prophet, you have nothing to do with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 159, that making sects is prohibited in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, Hold fast to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. The rope of Allah, it is the glorious Quran. Now there is a hadith in Sunnah Tirmidhi wherein our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said that the Ummah will be divided into 73 sects. All of them, they will be in hellfire except for one. And the one that will not be in hellfire will be the one that follows the path of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that the Ummah, it will be divided into 73 sects. That does not mean that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that make, 70, make sects in Islam. He never said that. We Muslims, we need to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Atiyullah wa atiyur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey his messenger. We need to follow the teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If we stick to the glorious Quran and to the teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we will never go astray. So we should abstain from making sex in Islam. We should be, the Muslim Ummah should be united on the Quran and the Sunnah. It is a requirement that we Muslims, we are united. Many Muslims, they fight on small and petty issues. But we should be united on the glorious Quran and on the teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So this was the limited time that we have, that we had today. And inshallah, my father will continue the same session, ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farak. I would like to conclude with the verse of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33. Woman Ahsan Kaula Mimman Dail Allahi, Wa Amila Sawali Hawakala in the Nimil Muslimin. Who is better in speech than the one who calls others towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, works righteousness, and says that I am a Muslim? Wa Akhiru Dawana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen.